Короче, мне кажется, что все с финал. Creo que ya es la final. Por fin, наконец-то. Game four, so the action has been popping off all day long, and, and 
we're hopping right in. So this is the early, early taste of what can or what is going to unfold here as our 32 teams are getting ready on the map. Yeah, I'm talking about Heat 2, Game 4. There are, are only six games of Heat. There are only two Heats in the Middle East region. Yes. So this is the back half of games that were happening across the world from us. At the moment, though, we're going to be tuning into looks like another team at retail as well popping through. Looks like there's going to be an early Elam getting knocked down. This house in particular as well, the doghouse, kind of connecting the residential and blacktop site, is kind of the place you kind of fight for control. Yeah, actually, yeah, this actually, is actually no, greasy. We're, yeah, we're in greasy. I was, I was going to interject, but you're yeah. kind of just on fire there. Yeah, we actually hopped with another team. We're looking at greasy ourselves. So you guys know that taco time might happen at any given moment now. And the cool part about that is it starts to heal and regenerate health. And then at the same time, everyone's uh, basically invincible. You cannot take damage during the time, but looks like, you know, a little defense being played here by DS, Q, and DX. And he gets the exchange here. And that's why they're going to be able to successfully save Ninja B. But again, the dancing happens, which, which, by the way, it heals the down player. Oh, for real? Yeah, so if you're down, your health comes back up. The only catch is if you're down in the storm, no one heals. And then at that point, it can be extremely detrimental. You don't want to go down in that time. But hey, if you're down, it's a good most of the time. The thing about early and mid game fights is utilizing down players as kind of, you know, strategic. I can kill an alcohol and cut the situation. There's a coin to let them go. There's a coin to let them go. Okay, so it's in the car. No more timers there anymore, right? The top of time will come back up. Hostage for a little bit. Yeah. Gotta hold them up. Absolutely. Use that little bit of leverage to bait out a team. Turn that into a winning situation for you. Because one of the, one of the, cons of going on offense is you expose yourself mm -hmm. you're out there you're vulnerable you're moving you're typically not building and in those situations that's where you get traded shots but here we're looking at retail row this is what we wanted to focus on nm7 fhd and beyond specifically have been hitting some disgusting shots over the course of today the heavy sniper we know to be a favorite on on a few of these players most teams only run with one sniper we've seen multiple players picking up snipers on this spot yeah, the biggest thing about the sniper as a power weapon, as a win condition type of weapon to make moves off of, when you have shockers, you can see right now in the inventory, right? Let's just take this example. You only have two chances to use that shock. You miss with a heavy snipe, depending on your heavy ammo count, which gets found okay. in much bigger, you know, varieties of 7, 13 ammo yeah. spread around the map. You have so many more opportunities to land that heavy sniper throughout any point in the game. It's more expendable, which means you can play off of it so much more frequently. That's right, and just taking a look here, Yonks is going to get a nice little power upgrade to the loadout there as he picks up a blue pump shotgun. So you know the confidence is in their favor. They're actually glancing over at the Black Sox, not quite sure. They saw a little bit of zombie, aggro zombie movement, uh, you know, from, from the fiends here kind of lingering about. And because of that, they're, they were cautious. They knew a team was here when we first checked in with them. Seems like the coast is pretty clear, and now they're going to they're gonna focus on uh, taking off the pylons here. Yeah, one thing I actually wanted to talk about, we noticed retail and greasy coming in, right? We also made that little mistake with the houses. The big thing, though, to note about that, a lot of these house layouts are very similar yeah. when you're looking at it inside. And with new POIs, suppose you are a team that goes retail, and it's so contested. Moving over to greasy and having that similar layout, knowing exactly how to play those buildings, and as well, looking at what are the power buildings in the POI. How does that kind of change the way you adapt to it versus a team that's not their monster? I mean, you, you absolutely need to know your layout. It's mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, one of the perks of mastering a, a place and playing off a place for long periods of time. Now, let's just say if, if things were to just change and something new is to show up, that could, that could be you know, a big issue for some of the competitors. But hey, the best of the best adapt, and, and someone's going to figure out how to make it work, right? Absolutely. You get the experience of playing in retail, apply it to Greasy, you might just get a whole new drop spot, right? Yeah, there's taco time. Hey, that's free shields. That's, as you said, the free utilization of having a knockdown uh, teammate, just staying alive. It's huge things you can play off of. We're going to be looking at a Polar Peak team right now. Also a very interesting POI that's been developed, kind of, in the meta game over this whole season. In the beginning, not many people wanted to land here, not seeing the actual potential of loot, as we did lose the big castle, but gained so much more map space and movement vertically around the map and actual sight lines towards Frosty, towards the cabins at the back, and even Happy Hamlet takes shots at people who are up here from Polar. Yeah, Polar Peak has always been one of those power spots to hold. Uh, you have this super high elevation, you have loads of rotation opportunity. And you can see here, this is this, it's been so long since we watched early game. 
I haven't even seen a team execute a proper kind of float across to, to big tree like that, right? So it's these are the small things that I nerd out over specifically is, is rotations, figuring out how people play their, their drop spots and, and figure out their, their loose situations. Some cool to note, guys, you actually don't take fall damage if you were to uh, fall off a high uh, place with me. You've got all the factoids down, man. These guys, I, I play a lot of tips. tips. Let's go, <laughs> boss. <laughs> it's something, to, something to think about. So don't panic, guys. If you ever want to really make an aggressive dive and push, it's actually a, a perfect opener to come in on the hoverboard. You are exposed, but you can jump off at any any elevation, any height. And if you you fail, it's okay. You'll be all right. That's a one thing you also. That one thing you also pointed out on it's actually he won game four from the Middle East at the moment, okay. um, which is a whole new slew of players that yeah. we're going to be seeing because we were watching Heat 2 previously. So we'll see how this Heat panned out, how the end games kind of differ. Before we saw a lot of top down shooting vertically, yeah. not many people challenging it late at all. A lot of mini guns, a lot of AR spam. Once that seventh zone kind of passed, it was free reign for those people on height. It's just about how many points can you efficiently accumulate. So now we'll see what are some of the other different type of win conditions end game monster that you've seen in Comp Fortnite. Hey, I mean, the name of the game is to earn points regardless. You see squads that like to execute zone six for high ground and then dominate, right? Put pressure down, dictate the pace again. You see other players that tend to kind of hold mid-ground tarp, hold down on shockwaves, and then make big moves towards the tail end, trying to try secure high ground, right? All of which are risk and reward plays. Um, personally, I think the scariest type of play style is going for height early. Those players that have the guts to go for zone six high ground, you're, you're risking all of your material at the expense of going for elims, which aren't guaranteed to you. And then you're trying to control the pace of the battle, which again, some people struggle, right, in those situations. Because if you don't do it properly, the server will turn on you. And now all of a sudden, you're, you're losing. Yep, Ever, there's always, there's so many teams alive near the end of the game, there's always one that can sense the weakness on height. Oh, yeah. oh you're double, you're not double tarping anymore. Your metal switched to wood. Here's an opportunity. Or, Where's or, the spam? You didn't, you're not hitting me. So yeah. Like, now it's time to fire back and set up those countermeasures. And that's that's the, that's one of the kind of tug of wars that uh, these these teams and trios face. But here we have Sidig, MS, Idish and Rampage here and looks like they are looking to battle here. So the team that we saw at Greasy here was already rinsing out. In comes the fire. So just exposing themselves. No fear at all. Just fearless out in the open. Using a little bit of ducking there. Kind of trying to naturally avoid some shots here. The shield bubble comes down. Invoke is on a weird position here. He goes for the high ground right now, and that's a shockwave. He's gonna leave his backside open. He's gonna suffer all of his shield right there. It's gonna be very painful. Now, one big thing to notice in this breakdown is on approach, Rampage, Sedig, and M Sedig all together were doing a 2 1 breakdown at all times. They always made sure there was one person a little bit higher, kind of switching roles to make sure they had that 2 1 split. And you see it in this fight. It's two people on a wall on one opponent. Then you have the breakdown of one person supporting up top. Right now, Rampage is in the big fray of the fight. Not sure exactly where his teammates are, but you can presume if he's on a wall, there is a teammate there to respond. Kimmy responds to the bullets by going absolutely knocked down in that state and now going to be getting siphoned by his teammates. Now everyone grouping together. This is very good use of timing in the fight because when you're split, you do have a lot of pressure, but there's a lot of risk involved. Now coming back together, if someone tries to peek you, you have three people aiming in. It's very good use of splits and regrouping. Yeah, and something to learn from that battle, guys, if you notice how quickly it ended, is because they, they managed to just isolate. They isolated the player, they hunted him down, they forced him into a frenzy to build up for high ground, and that was the first thing. After that, the rest of the team just kind of fell in suit, trying to uh, play catch up to save their teammate. But we've, we've seen a, a wonderful story of Minzu, Kinji, and Box Rider Moon all day today. They had high ground. They took second place in the first game we watched. Uh, you know, in, in a crazy turnaround and some shockwave plays that were made towards endgame. But we know they, they've been making it to the end. And they weren't on our radar previous to this. So to see Minzu, Kinji, and Box Rider Moon here finally making you know, a little, little stake of the claim for, for fame here uh, on the Fortnite competitive scene is really nice. This is one of the, one of the awesome things about being able to check out these new regions and, and give people opportunity. Oh, absolutely, this is the breakthrough moment at, at the moment. We've seen them be really good early game in Happy, but now they have the worst possible zone rotating in. It looks like it's pulling all the way up to the right side of the map, so they will be having a mid-game fight. Very smart use of utility, making sure with Stink you can actually track where your enemies are through that damage tick through the wall. Now you can see them actually responding after getting that first Elim 
This is what we're talking about earlier in the day. When you have a stick, it's not usually used to grief, but to gather info and then act upon afterwards. So now they're full body sending it straight into the box fight. As they're doing it, another two teams come up from the top. It's a huge mishmash at Grandma's house in the middle of the map. A lot of teams should be rotating through here. They might get even more action as Kinji goes down. That's what I want to talk about. It was the aggression, the fearlessness. Moon actually jumped into a 1v3 battle for high ground build. He held it down, but unfortunately Kinji's gonna get traded out here as Minzu was in the low ground trying to figure things out. And now suddenly, because they didn't, you know, pull back the reins and play a patient here, they found themselves in another battle, but looks like these things are putting into great work as they catch another small pick there. And they managed to fend off everyone, so we'll see if they can get the reboot card, maybe pull out a, a clutch save at some point or another, but teams are in shambles here. Absolutely, you know, you touched upon it earlier where, you know, we're happy to see these early games and, you know, in, in comparison to all the late games we always see, it's dope to cast a huge early to end game. One big thing that applies to both early he's, and he's end game zone, by the way. Oh, is yeah. timing. And this is a big use of timing right here, right? We do have a minute 14 till the zone moves. You do want to pick your teammate up. But now you're messing with not just one, but two resources. First of all, you're, using, you're losing a lot of time and positioning on the zone, as well as HP pools coming in. You do have a lot of loot you did gain from the fight that these guys just had, and slurps to tick through. But the stuff you use early to pick yourself up, you will not be able to utilize in the end game. So time is shared across both early and end. It's both effective. We don't usually get to see it used at the end game, but every decision you make, maybe they wouldn't have had that mid game fight if they were faster off their looting, right? So seeing exactly how they move across the map, how they utilize time can actually get into where they are in the middle and end game of their gameplay. Yeah, so they sent one player out to go kind of, you know, obviously get that revive and then they stood or they left Moon back behind to, you know, be that presence on the build, uh, the build on, on the skeleton that remains of what the fight was, so that the team below, you know, is, is cautious. They don't necessarily, you know, want to move or, or get that freebie rotation out of there. So the whole team is back. Now they're able to reap some of the rewards here, the, the loot that remains, and suddenly they're all back in action here. Now with that launch pad there, they are going to be okay to get the rotation, but remember, he did catch a knock, so notice. They, wanna, they just want to go ahead and take a peek see who's left here kind of loot can they still kind of grab up before it's time to go and it's a short rotation so they don't need the launch pad either looks like they are going to decide to probably go on foot here short rotation definitely risky though there are 65 people alive right now in the circle placement is a long ways away looks like Zanzis might be the last person in the trio from this fighter one of the trios trying to move in we'll see if it's possible for him to actually sneak through on this launch pad very patient game with there. Hopefully he has deals to come in. But this is the big problem with missed timing and getting in the zone a little bit later than you want. Kinji getting absolutely lit up in the air, gonna be launching down, might have to use hard mats early on, which means he won't have them end game. Once again, you see these connections between early and end. Usually you don't get to see why people are in such positions, but these guys took fights, they have to respond with the appropriate materials. And now they're actually turning gears to the offense. I think they noticed this guy was solo right here on the left. They do have a beam opportunity on the launch pad. Hopefully they get it. A lot of trees in the way though, Monster. This is very interesting to see how these guys are kind of moving around the map to get in the zone mid game. Yeah, so far so good. Again, another little buff up to the loadout. When you get that minigun, suddenly now you, you have the means to put the pressure up. And TR Zanzis is going to fall there as they were relentless on the push. They hunt him down, they catch him down right there. And that's going to be a nice replenish for materials and loot of the sort. And they're just, they're big chilling right now. They have everything they need. Medium, you know, light bullets. Mats are in a hurry because they're, they're asking for attention from the server. But other than that, the, the points are accumulated. The, the steam rolls beginning again. You know, the biggest thing to worry about is that zone still pulling up northeast over and over again. It means they have to move more vertically. There's already a hill in the way. Moving up pressure, you have to deal with lava, ever-changing ultimate low ground as well. There's so many things to take into account, and now they actually do have to move towards that way. The whole server could hold them back. We'll see if they use their utility to push through. And they're back with this team. We saw them earlier before execute a nice isolation and, and pinch push against a full trio. Looks like they're setting up their next siege here. You saw a couple shots trading out and interesting middle, the ME region kind of surprising me here with how much they are using just everything in their arsenal to fully commit to these battles here. They're throwing stinkers, laying down fire and then fully commit into rotations and box pushes here. So this is this is some aggressive play we're looking at, Shio. And it doesn't look like it's gonna stop anytime <laughs> soon. This is the type of play style we, we kind of signed up for here. We checked out this region and setting up the ramp bus right there. He's gonna catch the 50-50 wall, but doesn't matter. He 
goes even looking. So catches that guy off guard. Still pick right there. I think the difference in this trio is that usually people look for weakness to apply stinks to. They make the map weak. They make other trios weak first. Then they're like, oh, okay, these guys are weak. We're pushing in. They know exactly what fight they want to take. They actually make fights happen rather than sitting back and waiting for them. Right now, looks like these guys have four elims together. They're still affecting trios left and right, either picking up strays or making trios have just stray teammates. We'll see how much of an influence they have on the rest of the game because it looks like so far they've affected five different trios coming in from the bottom left side of the map. Yeah, Rampage actually took a lot of damage there, as does MSI Dig as well. And that's because the heavy sniper from the opponents nearby, they're just popping open those builds, following up with heavy AR fire. That's why they're able to, uh, unfortunately, that's why they lost a lot of health here. But now having to expend all the heals, it kind of seems like it wasn't worth it. The teams they've taken out didn't really reap big rewards here. Now they're in a weird situation, scrambling for health and loot, but it's okay. We're approaching zone five, it'll reveal itself in just 15 seconds. And then they'll have to make a big decision of whether they get to stay and kind of plan up or, you know, move out and use those shockers. The big thing about decisions is they're the easiest to make when you have a lot of options. Yep. The fact that they've ran out of all this utility, all these shields, limits their options. So now they have to play a certain type of way. They have to either find recyclable launch pads. Yes, they have the shockwaves, but then if they use them now, they lose the option as them for a win condition later in the game. So everything's kind of all on the plate now. They don't have any side dish available. No dessert coming up. It's one main course. They have to make sure it stays tasty. Hopefully they get in and it's an easy coming from them all the way to the later parts of the zone where they can utilize whatever utility they have left. Yeah, and this is a long rotation here, guys. They they actually did not look out. The zone is pushing further and further away. Lucky for them, you can see the server is proactive. They're moving first, which is good because if everyone's on the move, it allows you to cut across the field. The team's up on high ground. Hopefully, wouldn't have had their ARs loaded, but not the case here as Rampage gets chipped right out. He gets taken down the snow fly zone here. And he lands right next to the team. He's unsure of what he wants to do. He's trying to Stay close, but not fall down to you know, a layer where he cannot be saved. But it looks like that's it. This, that's it. This team split up. Rampage is out the game. Now it's, a, it's just a duo that remains here. It's MSI Dig and Sid Dig here. Cooking up this minigun. This is a very curious pressure point. So close to their opponents there. You can get punished and return with a shotgun. It's not going to be the case here. They're just dictating the push here. Jib goes down. It's going to be a nice catch for them. He actually just finished that. It wasn't even his Elim. So he's just trying to be really sneaky here. See if he can steal some of the re rewards here from the down body. But little does he know, it's, it's right over lava. It's probably not even retrieving. Yeah, I mean, one big contingency off of coming off of a launch and losing your shield, it's a very risky, very, very risky play, is going towards another trio. Yeah. As you saw, they use another person's shield bubble because you attract all that heat. Maybe that trio doesn't want to deal with it. They're low on max. They use their own resources, right? You turn three man's loot into six man's loot. The thing is, three of those people next to you are also not on your team. So as soon as they sense weakness, they turn right onto you. You saw that with Sadig here, who now has six HP, taking a whole minigun brawl from the trio that was closest to him, who was he, he was utilizing their shield bubble to kind of take protection from, but once that ran out, they knew exactly what was up. Now we're moving into that six circle off of half and half, 45 people left alive, 19 trios still there, seven need to go down for placement. Still a lot of trios left in the game here, and this is a really weird spot to battle, especially with the low health. You don't want to step in the lobby. You can't really afford to, and the elevation is only going to rise here as they go up and over the volcanic mountain. This is one of the steepest points in the world of the Fortnite, of the Fortnite world. This is similar to the a polar peak climb here. It's a very steep wall. You have to get up and over, and if they don't move soon, they're going to be stuck with their backs against the wall here. But you know what? It's more important, exactly, to try and pick up some siphon here. So single going down here is going to be huge. That's going to at least uh, help Sid to get some health here if he can kind of hold out. A launch pad is going to be placed down in Upsy Daisy. Now into the next zone they go, and great tracking of his teammate here. He does a, that's actually a phenomenal job, even under the pressure and the circumstances that you know, they, they found themselves in. Great job tunneling and, and finding his teammate. Yeah, even off of height and mid ground, you mentioned going through this weird zone that's very vertical. Height still has a tough job actually pumping in and making sure they can actually shoot down on people while they're moving around because they have to change exactly how high they are. That's why you saw these guys not get beamed exactly where they were. You have such a dynamic placing of all the mid ground layers as well, going up and down, changing layers based off of natural low ground. Because if you're too high, that's a threat, right? You want to be in the perfect position. Now they're using shockwave nades. The biggest thing about these though is when you're using them end game, you do take a 10 tick every now and then. 
these guys only have about 60 to 70 HP to play with. So every one of these shockwaves must be perfect, and some could also be saved. Jiren actually going down for a huge siphon Elim and Mats that these guys did need. They were almost shambles. Now they're not. The last almost shockwave coming in from Sadiq still taking ticks away from his teammate. Sadiq actually going down. Emsonin is the one up here. Another Elim on Fahad. He goes down. RPG available as well. Looks like Sadiq actually caught up with him in that mid ground there. Having mid ground over here is such a big deal as well because you don't have to deal with any of the vertical pressure or low ground weirdness that goes on with the change of the map. That's some interesting uh, decision making right there. They split the shockwave saying, you know what, we can't afford to make any errors, right? We can't we can't even shockwave together. Let's split up. Let's use our own shockwave so we can't make any mistakes. And that's what they're doing right here. They're trying to execute the perfect ways possible. Unfortunately, as I kind of brought it up, Dig does make a mistake there. And now he finds himself in an odd situation. He's in between all these enemies. His teammates up on high ground. Up he's trying to go to him. He's just landing in enemy boxes right now. That one big got to make a big move here, and he's going to get caught off guard there. Unfortunately, he did try to get that high ground. He was not fortunate enough to kind of secure the deal here. In comes the minigun pressure. This is an awesome job right here. NJ is going to fall down right there. The siphon has to come through here so he can get this health bonus. It's putting him in just a better and better situation as time ticks on. And it's looking like a solo right now. This is looking like a solo end game here, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone representing and looking out for themselves here. There's a huge heavy snipe shot right there. Diggs gonna get really hurt. Can he trade out a shot? The zone's gonna go ahead and finish him off here. His power finds that one right there. And it's MN7 versus versus this last player right here. There's only two players remaining, Shio. Yep. It's game four in heat one, and the competition is getting hot. We have a big pump coming in. ASMR spy goes down. The power ASMR rivalry finally ends in the end game. It's now a 1v1 to see who gets those final four points, three of placement, one for the Elam. Nice, big, easy, fast peaks coming down from NM7. Full Lana available. He does have that pump or shotgun delay since he has two tacks in. Will it make a difference? Almost not even out of mats at all. A nice 180 tack shot from height. Takes down DSQ and D for those big points in. Power is still on top. They can't be stopped right now. Huge game from them. That was wonderfully done for NM7. And with that, we're going to head over to the floor with Sundown to give us a nice little recap. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And we see the Middle East has been heating up in the action that occurred this morning. Honestly, I'm a big fan. I love watching it, watching the early games and the mid game, the discipline when the team goes, but also the little bit of chaos and kind of like fanaticism that happens in the end games when all of a sudden, just as Monster said, it turned into a solo game right there at the end. But let's dive in and see some of the plays that were made in the past game. And first, we're gonna hop on board with Toggle. His positional awareness and the fact that he's able to turn towards the rest of the storm and lay down these rifle shots 